10 seconds, I'd say, if you can't wait. That's it. Yep. See you, boys. No See you later. Roll that up a tiny bit. Here Hello. we are. <laughs> Podcast with Paul um, Redmond. Paul Redzar Redmond. Paul is a MMA fighter and a DJ. But we're going to be talking about more DJ and music <laughs> than MMA. <I> think. Lovely. <laughs> plumber as well. And a plumber. Come <laughs> here. You're the type of plumber that would cut a Sparks cable and say, fuck off. I fucking hate Sparks. I swear to God. They're bleeding useless. Uh, <laughs> the last 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 house I rewired, right? Well you hear this. So I'm lifting a few floor walls and rewiring the house. Nobody in the house, right? And the they got the plumbing done about a year previous, right? All right. the gas done and everything, right? So on the Friday I say to myself, I'll just lift up that room of floor boards in the front bedroom on there. So I'm all set to drill them holes in one. So I lifted the last fucked off out the door. I had the keys of the house, came back in on the Monday. The fucking ceiling on the floor downstairs. Now what the cunt of a plumber had done? Go on. He put his fucking when he put the nail back in the board, right? Went straight into the pipe, <laughs> right? Blocking the hole, perfect. When I took the floorboard up and it was a little bleeding jet of water, you wouldn't see. Emptied the hole, okay. emptied the whole system on the ceiling on the ground. I was like, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not coursing today. But anyway, plumber. Plumber, yeah. In the back, <laughs> and in the back there, get me a three fifteen out and a shirt off valve, right? That was a days. Yeah, are you still walking away now? No, I changed my job. I was working on the sites up until at the end of last year, and then i been doing plumbing maintenance. I'm still walking, but just not on this on the building site so anymore. So I'm plumbing maintenance in uh, Bounty Street College now. Sound, sound. I I walked on the sites. I walked on the sites for years. Then as I got a bit older, it's like fucking this is heavy going. Yeah, you know I, mean? I just I got to the point there. I, I was seeing uh, two lads, two L, two old boys. They were yeah. about mid fifties, I'd say, and they were carrying an oxygen bottle up the side of a bleeding building we were on last, not last year, the year before, or last year, sorry. And we were in there uh, out Sandy Mountain. The wind and the rain was coming in sideways. I just said, you know what? These two helpless look broke up. Yeah. Now when I say smashed up, yeah. which is that's not by me. Which is no, I can't can't deal with this till I'm fifty four, sixty four, no. just you know, yeah. weathered, bollocks, broke up every day. This is yeah. not by me. Yeah, that's. I was even was on a, the Microsoft site there a while ago, and we'd be doing the like outside lights, be course, handy yeah. enough, like you know, street lighting. But I was looking at the younger, like they were sparks, and they were the younger lads. I was looking at how like the tray and the big drums yeah. and carrying all the girls like good look. Yeah, it's too <laughs> yeah. much. Like, it's there's a time and a place for like and look I'm yeah. not old by any stretch. Yeah. Um but just no I'm not into it. Yeah. There's, there's, there's easier ways to make money. Hundred percent. So you walk as a DJ, yeah. Freelance. <laughs> yeah. A few quiet uh, gaff parties, <laughs> you know the sauce he's available get on to him get on to him on the old uh, few covid free few yeah. covid free bleeding <laughs> mask parties you lap. so you're a DJ in the cock and ball as well cock and ball and um, yeah I'm there once a week and then I DJ once a month in 22 town so throughout the years you'd be pricking around DJing well sorry for coursing you'd be pricking around um, in just little places like that and then just yeah uh, I was just settled them in the, in the cock and ball. They gave me, they gave me uh, a Saturday up there every week, and I enjoy it. Yeah. And when when did you start DJing? What age were you? Or how did you come into it? <coughs> oh yeah, I was I was I was fast. I always liked music. Every type of music, yeah. you know, the man. And then when I got to about sixteen, um, started liking house. It was more trance music back then. Like um, everyone enjoyed the old skill trance. Yeah. Um, and my mate Jay had a set of decks, and I was always fascinated by you know, record vinyl yeah, records yeah. and people being able to deal with it and stuff and I've asked him to uh, sort of show me a few things on it he did and then I ended up going out and buying my own at about eighteen, seventeen, eighteen, a set of vinyl decks. They weren't great and then was just messing around with them for years. Probably the Aristons or something it's like calm, that. Cam we think, oh, Cam right. direct drive. Yeah. Um so they were decent enough yeah. but like they weren't technical as well yeah, yeah. they weren't they weren't the, the dog's bollocks. Yeah. But I learned how to mix on them and stuff and then I just uh, 
got rid of them, got the point of CDJs and was on them for a while and you'd be down some of the ass you to do with twenty fours and you'd go down, you'd have about twenty bleeding tunes there. Yeah. You look at my now father Ted with one <laughs> record, you know what I mean? Be going back to the start and back to the start. But look, I walked out and then um I was just down that for years and years and never really thought of going, you know, taking on uh, more than twenty four, so then you just fucking you do another few and another few yeah. and then one thing leads to another like anything else. Yeah, yeah. Now I like I like me music and I'd like I'd like I would have liked all the acid house music and then as it came into rave but I like you know D- Detroit house yeah. and New York house and I'd be I'd more like house music of course, yeah. but I like me a bit of disco as well yeah. you know I like a bit of everything Evan. I used to like um, the fella that swims with us down here Dean Scurry his cousin Billy Scurry and he used to throw in loads of disco tunes into a set as yeah. well like years ago was. I, I like that type of stuff that's you know? a good DJ if you can yeah. mix around one, one genre to another yeah. and, uh, and make it seem seamless yeah. uh, that's a, that's to me that's a good DJ yeah. you know? bit of Barry White Trey Clock in the morning nothing beats it nothing beats it pumping nothing beats it yeah and um, you so you're on vinyl when did you swap across or do you still have vinyl do you no, still have records I don't have I, do you know what I'm sick that I, I, I sold me me, me turntables but I saw I I gave away all my vinyls with them when I was selling them, and right. I was free to do. There's some cool records in there that I can't even th- I can't even remember the names of yeah, them. Yeah. Um, they were probably you know you just picked them white um, labels, white out labels, yeah. or just ones that you I just couldn't remember the name of. But I have the tune in my head, and I wouldn't even be able to sing it. <laughs> but yeah. I, you know, um, we used to get them in um, Abbey Discs. And right. Billy, Billy had been yeah, there. Yeah, and he'd yeah. be, Throwing out white labels that he'd be yeah, printing yeah. himself, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the old the old way of doing things. Yeah. But um, now I got rid of them, and then about twenty one, I got obviously everyone was got everything was going CDs, and but this before MP3s had come in, so C, point eight CDJs were the club standard then at, at that time, and I just got a set of them, and um, yeah, just started going on from there. Then I got rid of them. Everything got off CDs then as well, so you can get a USB stick and put like a couple of thousand tracks on that. Yeah, yeah. Plug that in now, and it just yeah. it's that's the way it's gone now, you know. It's mad that like a blast from the past there mentioning Billy. A good few of my mates were DJs. I wasn't a DJ, yeah. but was into it. Yeah, of course. And Saturday in, and you see all the bleeding raincoats going in through the <laughs> leaving through the music. You know what I mean? It's I forgot about that. Do you yeah, know what I mean? it's, you know what? It's it's the different way, there. The way the things have gone now, um, like. It's a Starbucks now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I walked by it there. I walked by it there a while ago, and I was just saying, that's that's Ireland there. That's the history of yeah. like DJing around. We've asked mm-hmm. anybody in Dublin about DJing from around a couple of years ago. With the Abbey Discs has to be on yeah. the, the the front of that, uh, the tip of the tongue, you know. Yeah. And I so I hate the way Ireland is going now. It's very, it's yeah. bland, you know. But he, he he knew what the sus was with dance music, but also what our stuff as well. He knew his music, like you know. Yeah, we used to rock into him and say, "Billy, what have you got for me today? What are you after? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the trance records, right? And he'd start pulling out a load of stuff. White label. Well, you think the white label is going to be." Just there's, there's only three of these. <laughs> yeah, he's had a seven I mean, tour. Oh, you'd you walk know? in, I've two <laughs> records here, and he'd be just fucking them out, but they'd be good tunes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, give me them, just give me them. Yeah. You know, and he wouldn't be charging a top whack for them and all that. And he was he was just a people person, you know, yeah, but yeah. it's just sorry, sorry that, that type of stuff is gone. You don't yeah. have that anymore. No. You want a new track, you go on online, B part, and yeah, just yeah. download it from there. Yeah, I forgot about all that. Yeah, he used to come in with <laughs> Big the glass in the past. Yeah, yeah, and some lads would be putting their headphones on a plane. No, I'm not into that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. They're Deadly, deadly. Now I, 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 I would like me DJs. I like David Holmes. Still, I listen to yeah. his stuff. I like uh, Danny Tanaglia. Yeah. There's certain DJs. He's I like. sixty now, by the way. Is he? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was only listening to him there on B part. They did like a, a B part sessions, is what they called. He was yeah. on it, and they were saying that Danny Tanaglia and something was underneath it. And, 60 years of age and he nailed that session to the wall he did unbelievable I liked uh, Andy Weatherall died there about 2 years ago I think but I liked his stuff he mixed Primal Scream he used to mix that Happy Mondays early yeah. stuff and I liked him as well I wouldn't be into the like Carl Cox types but yeah. I'd, I'd like I'd see like I'd be along the, I, I do like Carl Cox yeah. but then 
like if you go to a beat and now you can go like one side of it is pure techno and all yeah. that end if you want to go to which is great or one side of it is that big EDM but I'm not into it it's the, just yeah, yeah, music yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there's another side then it seems to be going real disco uh, yeah. back to you know, I, disco I, that's, I love that stuff yeah. that's, I love all that Th- stuff that was big there was a big resurgence in that in the last two or three years yeah. and um, Defected were one of the ones that they yes. bring that out yeah, yeah. they brought out a new sort of name named Sam Brown Sam, Sam Devine Sam Devine sorry Sam Devine um, the owner that Simon Dunbar and he has uh, he created like a disco label Glitterbox and that yes. that'd be one of the biggest sort of di- disco nights on the on the island now yeah, but yeah. they seem to be trying to revive disco basically you know and it's good yeah no brilliant brilliant I like uh, I like do you ever go to New York no do you ever di- well if you go to New York I did about four years ago I done um, the hip hop tour over there Oh, so great, but that's the place the to do it, yeah. And it was very, very first block party ever. A fella called Cool Herc was your man's right. name, DJ. And he did the very first, and you go around all the, the See, sights that's cool. and sounds. I'd like to do something like that, yeah. Yes, is, um, it was savage. It was <laughs> savage. And they bring you around all the spots of where all kind of the origins of fucking yeah. dance music, rave music course there. Disco started, you know what I mean? Well, it was it was kind of after disco because disco was over, and then the MC started to come up. You know, there was a big uh, what was it in the, the late seventies, early eighties? Um, they had that disc. They were born in disco records in yes. the in the the um, uh, baseball stadiums. There was it was, it was, it was uh, get rid of all your disco records. Yeah, and yeah. They, they tried to get rid of it. Yeah. And, um, that sort of how house music came around, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. Now it's it's it. <laughs> Like it came from, it started off in Detroit, but it's somewhat hip hop kind of. It got a different taste when it went to. It house music started off in Detroit, but when it came to New York, they wanted to talk more. So instead of being a DJ, it was an MC, master of ceremonies. Right, so yeah. they were talking over the records more. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Instead of just putting them on and letting people dance, you know. So kind of changed. But then with the Detroit house, once it went to Ibiza in the early 80s, they put their spin on it. And that's where it really kicked that's off for us as we know Pete dance Tom music. And all those boys yes. over in, over in Ibiza, wasn't it? I started off with the Acid House, first of all, but that that, that went into rave. Like, that what was a early time 80s. to be alive, Acid House. Well, I was only, I was only talking to Andy there the other day, and, uh, just about music and stuff like that. And I was saying, wouldn't it be great to be... I, I, didn't, I was a bit um, young for... Uh, the parties going around back then, but you couldn't do it nowadays because of phones. Like we were talking about, yeah, yeah. And people letting people know yeah, what's yeah. going on. Yeah. But the early acid house uh, raves, um, they would set this thing up in a field in the UK, mm-hmm. miles out in the middle yeah. of nowhere, and then you would have to get a phone call on the side of the road yeah. of some motorway to let you know where it is. <laughs> And that is how you got to an illegal rave, and they couldn't have about a hundred thousand people in it, or you know, and you just couldn't pull anything like that off. And these cars days. following cars, and and where are you? And then what the coppers used to do is they'd show up, and they'd pretend they were going to a rave and drag like fifty cars off yeah. that way, and they'd be driving. It's mad. Great. It's mad. Yeah. And then in in I would have went to a lot of early kind of rave in this country. And and the rave that started off in the UK, be it in Manchester or London, started off in the gay scene. Right. You know, that's where mm-hmm. it kind of really yeah. kicked off. They came back from Ibiza. But in here, it kind of kicked off. And I don't know the name of the club. I never went to it. But Sides is where it kind of really started here in really? the early yeah. 90s. You had like um, Liam Dollard, Billy Scurry, yeah. uh, Mick Walsh. They were in Sides. There was another club, I don't know what the name Asylum. was. No, it was the Asylum came after that. Really? It was, yeah. yeah, there was a gay club in Temple Bar and it burnt down or something and then they all kind of moved to Sides. So Sides was the they start right. of and then when things when when things got a bit ropey in Sides with kind of as the drug dealers move into the area yeah. the lads moved to the Temple Sound and used to do the almond Right. The almond uh, print walks. That's yes. It was just, like, see, I, I, I'm just where the too, Morrison I'm was. Too young for all that. I know I've heard of them. Where the before. Morrison was hotel was right. That was like an abandoned like print walks. And Saturday nights they used to. 
I don't know. You'd, you'd rub up against something and you'd come home and you'd go, look at that bleeding state of that. And you'd muck all over the place. And that's where the very first kind of, and the asylum then came after that. The asylum was like 90, 90s, but it was after, so it's right. a couple of year or two, you know what There's I mean? There's another one I've seen, um, I've seen a couple of videos from the Olympic ballroom. Yeah, that was, that was, I was only up there a couple of times. <laughs> right. That was, I've that seen was, a couple of videos. That was a lot younger. That, that was like from 14 to 17. That was a oh, lot right. younger, you know, but it was still, still, uh, mm. I've only, the, my earliest sort of uh, raves before it got closed down was the Temple Theatre. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's such a good venue. Um, I know it's next to the hospital, and you couldn't put raves on in it now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> raves yeah, on yeah. in it now, yeah. but it's such a good venue, and yeah. it, it goes. It's wasted there. Where it yeah, is. Like, yeah. I actually don't know how they got uh, how they got away with uh, putting a venue there next to a hospital, a children's hospital, yeah. and outside a big block of flats. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think I was in that towards the end. I, I went into it once or twice. And yeah. I was just like bleeding. Since there are children here. <laughs> well, see, that's it. I, I only <laughs> went into when I was 17, 18, yeah, and then yeah. it got closed down. Yeah. You know, but it still sits there idle, you know? Yeah, yeah. Now, I, did, I, I was in the asylum a few times, but Sides was where the kind of really. So, where is Sides in town? So, do you know where do you know where the Mercantile Hotel is? Yeah. Right there. Oh, right. Sides DC, that's what it was called. Up the lane, maybe. Kios around. See, so I know these names. Andy does be telling me about them. Sides, Realm, yeah. there's a few others. Yeah. Um, now, Jets wouldn't have been a ray of. Yeah. But it was a nightclub, yes. up, you know, that I've never been to. So I'd hear, yeah. the, hear all these names. Jets, the time. all them toys. Me growing up, right? And I kind of came through. I didn't start going out just as this kicked off. But. I got out to cricket club in Clontarf. Sorry, lads, not tonight. <laughs> You're not dressing. Yeah. Sorry, lads, and sorry, lads, and you'd be with your ropey ID yeah. trying to get in. I promise we made it. <laughs> and then when you were going to Sides or the Olympic ballroom, like there was bouncers, but there was nobody asking you. Go ahead. You're not dressed. Yeah. You're not this. And it's like, this is deadly. Yeah. There's none of that bollocks, like, sorry, mate, wrong shoes tonight. And, See, that's what know. I like about sort of dance music and house music. It seems to be all inclusive. Yeah. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be, you know, if you're wearing a pair of runners and dressed a certain way to somebody who's dialed up to the bleeding noise, yeah. it seems to just include everyone into yeah. it. You know, that's what I, 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 I like as well. And like house music is deadly as well. Like, no, it's, it's, and sides, sides you had, like, you had people in drag, you people in all sorts, nobody cared. Yeah. It's just for the music was well, but nobody cared, like, you yeah. know what I mean? And Liam Dollard had come back. I think he was walking in Manchester. I was listening to something there on him a while ago. Liam, trying to get him on the podcast. Right, he's, yeah, he's, yeah, uh, yeah. He's not on Instagram that much, he's <laughs> on it. But he had just come back from Manchester. So if you were anywhere like that in the early 90s, it was like... He was in Manchester. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was a big deal then. You know, it was Never a huge got to deal. Manchester, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a big deal then. Like, and he had all these different mad records which he bought home, which was. See, which that's was, the thing. There's nothing. There's nothing niche anymore. There's mm. nothing. You don't. One record. If somebody has one record now, it's everywhere. Everyone has it. You know. There's no way. Uh, like that, you can't get a white vinyl press. Now limited edition yeah. that nobody has. Like they yeah. tried to do, they're trying to do with vinyl again, where it's, you know, they are only printing. But somebody will just put that on it and rip it and put it to the to the online anyway. Yeah. So you're gonna get it regardless, you know. Yeah. So all the records are out there. So back then it would have been the best. Whoever had the best records was the best DJ. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. And even like songs that he like plays, like Nikolai Apollonia, yeah. Moon Boom. I still call it they're Liam Dollard's records <laughs> you know when yeah. I hear them it's like yeah. that's Liam Dollard's you yeah. know what I mean whereas then the mansion house used to have a few raves in it but right. they used to bring in talent from the UK whereas it was kind of I don't know it was a subconscious thing like I went to see Shades of Rhythm there but it was a subconscious thing that now it's the Irish DJs are as good yeah, and they just, were as good you know what I mean it's just a stigma like anything mm. else somebody's coming in from a broad or he must be better you yeah. know or it's, it even goes to be, uh, with fighting and stuff like that you yeah. know you're, you're from Ireland you're not as good as those guys are you know mm. boy, you're as good as anyone like, you're as good as anybody and and the temple of sound they moved to the temple theatre but they used to bring in fellas like Felix the house cat Billy Nasty yeah. they used to bring in big acts but You'd be there to see Scurry and Dollard and, course, and the yeah. Irish fellas. Yeah, they were grand. They were like 
the, your Bellator headline. It's like, oh, we're bringing in these two fellas. Everyone watches the Irish fellas. The foreigners are headlining. Everyone's gone. Gone. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's gone, like, out of the tree, really, you know. <laughs> similar type thing, you know, similar type thing. I suppose you better talk about a bit of MMA here. Right, come on. <laughs> right, um, the first time I seen Paul fight, and I was only saying this to him earlier on, was um, in DCU, Cage Warriors. That the, Greek young the, the Helix, yeah. The Helix. Great venue. What year was that? Um, 2014. Was it? Yeah. So that's... Because I got signed after that fight to the UFC. Seven years ago. And 2015 I got signed to the UFC, so it was the year before. And um, I remember the fight. A man was bleeding down mad stuff, jumping out the side of the cage, and he was real. <coughs> he was... He was just unorthodox. Very unorthodox. Say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he took that fight on t uh, three weeks' notice. I think we were so, uh, signed to fight somebody else, and then we got a phone call saying the guy had been injured. And, you know, they were struggling to find a, a, an opponent on such short notice because um, I think it was the co-main event on, on for that fight. Um, but they got someone, um, Ian Dean got me someone like he always did, and uh, yeah, it was a good fight. He, like I said, he came out throwing mad stuff. Yeah. And, um, I think he went for my for the towel hold on me first, and yes. I was at the winning a couple of towel holds before that, and I just was lovely, <laughs> yeah, 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 you know. Yeah. So uh, it was it was a nice win, mm -hmm. and that was I remember Artem was on that night as well. That's when Artem yeah. was the prospect killer, and he yeah. had some comeback. He, he, he took the fight on a day's notice. Andrew something like Fisher, that. And yes. I think he was losing the fight, yeah, he was, and then yeah. he ended up TKO TKO and Andrew in the last second, of the last round. Yeah, it was. It was, it uh, was literally four fifty nine, and Mark Goddard stepped in, and it was one second, and the belt was gone. Yeah, some comeback. That was a. Uh, that was a. Uh, that like them. Everyone always says they like the all nights, but it was it's I prefer them because. There was kind of the people that there knew what they were about, yeah. knew what they were looking at, you know what I mean? It See, was the amount of people I've talked to over the years since those nights, there must have been about 300,000 people in the Helix that night, the way people going about it. <laughs> and I think it only sits 900 people. Yeah. Like there was no one there. <laughs> I remember, because I was late there. There was probably, was there 150 people in the place? Uh, starting off, it was a full house by the end of the night, right. boy. Uh, for nine hundred people, I thought, but everyone and everyone have talked yeah. that when Connor won the belts and you know Siri yeah. won the belt, yeah. they were all full nights. But it's nine hundred people, yeah. and I've talked to more than nine hundred people, and they all swear they were in the the Helix stand those yeah. nights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah, but they were good nights down there. That's good. Mm. That's good. And then I seen you grappling on Andy shows, which haven't been on a while. Keith Cabin. Oh in, yeah, yeah, Keith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a while ago. Yeah. Finished them with uh, some weird Kamara. Kamara, you kind of soil control. Reverse Kamara, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keith's good lad as well. Yeah. And um, but yeah, I just uh, I like I just like uh, I like competing. I like I like just I like doing stuff. I just keep uh, keeping active. You know, yeah. I think it's good for the head. And you know, if you have a, it's the thing with competition is it just keeps you focused. Like at the minute for the last year, with all this COVID and stuff was going down. Nobody knows when there's an end to it in sight. Nobody knows, you know, if you're an amateur, you can't get a fight. Even if you're a professional, I, yeah. I haven't been able to get a fight in, in, in over a year now. Um, but with competition, there's a goal at the end of it. It keeps your mind focused for X amount of time. Yeah. And while you're in that, say, say you're doing a fight camp for a, for a fight, it's usually an eight to ten week block. For that eight to ten weeks, you're thinking of nothing else, getting fit, getting your sleep getting your food right and that's it yeah. nothing really crosses your mind because you don't have time for bad thoughts or anything like that to be creeping in because you're up early doing your run you may have to go to work you're back getting your sleep you're cooking your food you're going training that night and then you're too bollocks to even fucking have a bad thought or anything like that yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're just going to sleep yeah. so it's that's how you keep focused and I think Competition is really good for the mindset for anything like that. So mm. That's why, I, no, that's not why I like competing, but I do think it, it, it does help, you know. Yeah, and I think that's what separates. Like, there's people out there that compete, and there is athletes that make up one percent of gym populations. Oh, like yeah, high level athletes, but that's what separates the one percent from the ninety nine percent, and that's important too. Of course, you know yeah, I mean? absolutely. That type of thinking. Yeah, you know? I think. Um, 
like there's a lot to be said about even just training and and uh, just goal setting. Even if you even if you're going to a gym, why are you going to a gym? You know, mm. well, to get fit, and maybe lose three kilos. Do the three kilos? Oh, well, maybe we do two, two two kilo more. Mm. So just goal setting constantly, and I think that that's a, a big uh, big help. But yeah, the one if, if it's even one percent out of mm. every gym that sort of goes on to fight, and it, I'd be amazed, you know. Mm. And. I'd always like whether I'm talking to lads that play for Dublin, play championship football. I always, I just, I like talking to people about training and just yeah. getting their opinions on it, you know. And uh, I'm bleeding some name drop. I was talking to Marcus Feeling there a while ago, and, and the way I was talking to him about jiu jitsu, I was after doing a round with him, and he's like, like what you just said there, and this is. I find a lot of high level athletes have this attitude it's like okay you're after getting smashed but what can you take away from it yeah. that little win what little yeah. battle did you win did you stop him getting full mount on you did you take away the little it took, going, it, it took me a long time for that. it took me a long time to realise that um, I, I didn't come from a, a, a necessarily a training background for, you know the way kids sort of go boxing when they're younger and did no sort of a routine a training routine this that I didn't. I came from going to raves every weekend. <laughs> I, just from the building site and the raves every weekend. I, I, I wanted to just ch- sort of... I, I t- thought, knew there was something else out there that yeah. instead of doing that little loop every week, five yes. days in work, three days at the weekend, flat and I'm out drinking and doing everything else, a bit of messing. Yeah. And I just... So I tried... I, I, I was looking at the, U, uh, the UFC on an old station called Bravo at the time. Yes. And then... Uh, I think it was about a year watching it, and not that I ever fancied myself as a fighter or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. I just thought these these guys all looked in serious nick. The training must be good for it because I've tried to go to the gym over the years. You do a couple of bench presses, right? I'm going to the sauna, mum, and I just it was never. I didn't I didn't understand it. So even when I got into Andy's uh, and sort of started training like that, I'd be getting smashed in the gym and I'd be going home and I'd be I'd either saying ah, oh, that was a show session I couldn't get out on yeah. anybody but I never I wasn't saying to myself well, hang on you're only in the gym a couple of weeks mm-hmm. what, what can I take away from it and it took me about two or three years to say right or a few people telling me like there was there, there was a couple of the good bodies in the gym black belts now like the black belts but at the time you'd be asking them say Liam O'Till Steve O'Till Carl Roach John Donnelly Siri any of those guys trying, trying to not go to Andy to, for the coach because he's the main coach yeah yeah but they'd be giving the little tips and they'd be saying, you know, maybe practice arm bars this week. It doesn't matter if anybody passes your guard, smashes you a million times with anything else. If you get one bar, arm bar throughout the whole round, it's a, it's a, it's a success. It's a win. It's a win. That's, that's what you're practicing this week. So then you do that over time and you obviously get better at it. And you say, right, we'll try something else. Try now, not, now try not get smashed and get the arm bar. And then over time then, uh, like... It's just building blocks, you know. But like that, and um, the way you've said it, yeah. Uh, if you can take something out of every session, great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now that's uh, that's that's what I took from him, and a, a lot of people that I talk to are like that, and on the smaller details, you know, it's about not getting. A lot of people get overwhelmed, especially with jiu jitsu. They get smothered yeah. and get overwhelmed. Why has a, such a high dropout rate? You know, it's a horrible feeling, though. Like I remember <laughs> being in, uh, going in. Uh, Say up until it was a blue belt. So I'd say up all all of white belt. If you're going down and you'd say you wouldn't be calling anybody out. You'd be saying, "Do you want to roll? Do you want to roll? Do you want to roll?" And then you just get guys like that. Uh, could be a good wrestler. Or could come from a wrestling background or a judo background, but have a white belt on them. Yeah. You wouldn't know. You'd get wrecked on the match. You say, "What the? What? Again, it's close up. Jiu Jitsu is very close up. Oh, some fella sitting on top of you on your chest, like you know, <laughs> get off me, get off me, and you'd be having some fella sitting on your chest. It's nuts, like it, it really is nuts, it's frustrating. I think I was down Jiu Jitsu, I think I was down about six years at the time, and I probably was a purple belt about six months, you know, and I was in America. Right. And uh, it's a little gym, we, we go to the same place in New Jersey, a little gym around the corner. Actually, the fella that owns it used to fight in the UFC, Kurt Pellegrino. Oh, not well enough, from have yeah, heard yeah. Really nice fella, but. He has an open mat on a Saturday. Right. I rock him, he put well few blue belts yeah. with you, this and that. Mill you everyone. know, just <laughs> like it's 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 a cool place, but so I see this white belt, you know, I'm after doing a couple of rounds, you know, yeah. and it's, it, 
I, I see this white belt I said run at all and, and the man goes oh yeah um, he's no English like he was Russian or something you know and I'm you know the white belt yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, let him get some <laughs> next of all blade and he's on me back <laughs> he's on me back he's hooks in and I'm fighting and choke for about two minutes and he's bleeding bow and arrows me yeah. and then I'm like right you cunt you the, next, the next time I'm like right you cunt it out I'm looking at the clock about two minutes this cunt's getting it <laughs> next of all he's bleeding butterfly me and turning me around and the whole lot. I did six rounds after that right he handballed me yeah. I did six rounds after that and for them six rounds after You're that, frustrated all I could think about <laughs> was getting handballed by him. And I'm doing them six rounds going, that's me, I'm done. I'm, I can't believe. And I went over the court at the end of it. And I was like, who's that man? Oh, he's a bleeding animal. I was like, what's he got a white belt on him for? Oh, he's a brown belt. He's, he's nearly a black belt. He, 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 he doesn't train with us. He trains <laughs> He trains with Yunti Jiu Jitsu in New York. He does about four hours every day. Yeah. He forgot his belt, so I just and I was like, that "Thank fuck for that." that. <laughs> <laughs> I was throwing <laughs> me, me shoyer all. He was going in the bin on the way yeah. home, fuming. But that's the old ego crushing. Of course, yeah. the old ego. But Look, I couldn't get him out of my mind. If you have an ego in jiu-jitsu, it's, it'll be taken away from you fairly fucking quick. Yeah, no, hundred percent. But you need an ego as well. My little ego is like. My ego was after he choked me out the first time. This one's just me. getting it. Yeah. <laughs> this one's getting it. You know, you need yeah. that too. Like, oh, you can't be like, oh, no, um, like, that's I'm, I'm, there, there, Do you know what? There is some. I think there's a place for sort of everyone in, in Jiu Jitsu. Like, and it, that, it, I won't say it's wrong to say, but there is fellas like that. Don't like to be handballed. Don't like to be. Don't like to even give it back to people. Yeah. They just want to learn the bit of technique, the mm. bit of friendship, the bit, you know, that comes yes. with Jiu Jitsu as well. That's fine as well. Yeah. You know, but when I want to roll, I want to roll. Yeah, I yeah, want yeah. to, and if you put it on me, right, well, then let's tap hands and go straight again. Yeah, now, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, there's a good lad now, Jim, was wrestling. Uh, he, he, he does wrestle with his brother, and uh, they're from Moldova, and, they're, you know, they're quite strong. They wouldn't have. Uh, the submissions there yes. but my god trying to sweep on them was unbelievable like, you can't and they'll probably give you the hardest round in the gym because they're just that top pressure. pressure just pressure pressure okay. pressure and you'll go with them the two boys every, nearly every time just because they're giving you that hard of a bleeding yeah, roll yeah. you know yeah. um, but it's like if they pass me guard I'm disgusted so I'll have to go, and go again and go again and go again yeah. but it's, the, it's the, probably the best round one of the best rounds in the gym yeah. I find with with I, I rolled with his Moldovan as well, Nikolai. Oh, yeah. And I rolled with Nikolai or any of the Moldovan lads that, that are in Sergei's. And I don't know what it is with them, but there's just, there's no give up in them. Nothing. <laughs> and no I, I, I like that. Them. I like that. There's the competition. If you're going mindset. out the front door scrambling and yeah. then go across the car bag, yeah. you know what I mean? There's no, no give up in them. I think it just makes, if you're in that competition mindset, mm. it makes for. Um, a, uh, a more real feel to it mm. so if you're going that 100% of the gym you're not going to kill each other doing yes. a bit of jiu jitsu yeah, so yeah, you can yeah. go 100% obviously not sparring mm. but it gives that fatigue in the arms fatigue in the legs you're just saying right mm. and it, it transfers over to competition yeah. because that's when you're going to get the fatigue in the arms so I think it's a good thing to have that in the gym yeah there's also two Chechen Yunfus from um, from John's gym Mohammed and his brother Ahmed right. and I see them and when I see them they're only young like, oh here we go yeah. they're just killers <laughs> animals yeah. one's a white belt the other is a blue belt a white belt and I'm just like when I see them coming at me I'm like have they wrestled not, before not dangerous they just they're tough and they have a bit of technique now Mohammed is a very good blue belt right. he's one of the best he's about 95 kilos big lad but you want to see this fella burn and bowl it. You yeah. want to see this fella move, but has heavy top pressure as well. And very good in the gi. Yeah. Very good in the gi. So moves very well for Do you prefer gi or no gi? No gi. You, you like no gi? Yeah. Do you know what? I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm on the fence now lately. Because I haven't rolled gi in a, a good while. I was went, went no gi down the rabbit hole no gi for a while. I went yeah. into all the heel hook type yeah. things. Because that's the way jiu-jitsu went for yeah. a couple of years. And I think it's, it's getting... Right, they hit the, it's like the, if stuff in Jiu Jitsu comes in phases. Yeah. The Baron Bolos is around for a year, yeah, yeah. two years. Yeah. Then they are like, right, it's been done. 
then heel hooks came in and then not came in they were always around I liked yeah. doing them years ago yeah. but then they became popular yes then everyone started doing them like ah just now I'm, now I'm sort of going chokes and that type of stuff now I'm trying to do that now but I'm, I'm fancying the gear lately I I I because I, I I'm came from cycling background so I like that cardio aspect and I find the gay is too stally and I, I I get lazy because I know all the chokes some of them and when I go I can stall it yeah. down slow it right down whereas even the fellas that are only starting off with no gay you can't scramble, get grips on them scramble, you can't scramble, get grips scramble. so I'm walking away from it going I feel like I've done something okay yeah that's why I like yeah. it. You know what I mean? Not that I'm great at it. No, I get you. you know no, I mean? 100%. That's what I always tell fellas. Um, or even anyone that wants to start. Uh, if You know, if they're not in the best of shape, do the gi. Because mm. you don't it's need to be. Yeah, it's a slower pace. And then they're saying, oh, well, I'll just try the no gi. I'm like, try it. Yeah. <laughs> it, might, it might be for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. Maybe pick up. Do it or whatever. Yeah. But um, it, it's definitely faster. And I, I then... My young flip does a lot of wrestling and I do a bit of no gi with him and he puts that bleeding, he's, he's an Irish young flip, but puts that Moldovan bleeding style pressure yeah. on you of pressure passing and squashing me and I'm just fighting for Get out me now, they're not be able to make it away. Elbows into faces yeah. and <laughs> survival. If you if you seen the two of us going at each other, like it's it's like a <laughs> mill, you know what I mean? Well, then, like, it's but it's good. Can do that, yeah, you know no, I mean? it's good. It's good. Oh, but I, it that kind of has come in. I find with why the wrestlers are that good is that Dan Danaher pressure, that pressure passing, the way they use it. Like they do, they're known for heel hooks and stuff, but actually their jiu jitsu is. It's top. Oh, it's top whack. It's, uh, I think he's a, a really good instructor. I've seen a couple of his DVDs, and um, I just it's a hard listen to. Mm. I've, I've seen his DVDs, and he'll do it. Rep- it's so repetitive. Mm. It's one. It's a. It's a good thing that it's just that repetitive because obviously it's going to get drilled into your brain. But for me watching it, I'm just like. Yeah, yeah. Just show me the and it, it'll go. Like your hand has to be here, then it has to be here, and then do that, and then it goes keep step by step by step. So it, in the, in a way, it gets you listening. It gets you realizing all the steps. But by the tenth, fifteen step, they're like, yeah, just mm. just show me the blade, man, move, you know. But what he what he's doing out there, um, with, with his athletes and stuff, mm. um, is unbelievable. And I trained with Gordon Ryan over in Troy Star a couple of years ago. He was only a brown belt at the time. Right. Tom Breeze had him flown down from New York, or flown up from New York, up in the Camden, up in the Tristar. For the week, they were friends, they were pals, and they would go down to Dan Harrison, or well, Henzo was in yeah. uh, New York from time to time. And some of the stuff he was showing Tom was like unbelievable. And they were all saying, this is the next big team to come out. Because yeah. at the time, it was Gary Tone and, um, was, the, was the main guy, and uh, Eddie, Eddie Cummins. Cummins, yeah, yeah. we were in. Um, they were the two guys yeah. that were at the EBIs and winning everything and, and Gordon was only his uh, brown belt at the time yeah. and as soon, as soon as he came on the scene that's yeah. that you know mm. now I I, uh, I I I have seen them you know I, I have that house where we rent and where we stay in, in New Jersey Gary's Brunswick Jiu Jitsu it's probably about 30 minutes oh, drive nice. away from it so we've trained with Gary and with Gary's lads he like a good few times I like, sound yeah. he sound real nice a really good story about Gary I had to get I had no Uber app oh right yeah, yeah. and he one night we turned up to do it as yet and was like how and he paid for our bleeding Uber back to the train station <laughs> sound fella yeah. like, really really yeah. nice fella you know but I, I like their style they kind of switched me onto the no gay stuff because my uncle spent two months in New York and came back with all his ideas yeah, yeah. it's kind of and I find their style that pressure passing suits me a bit more really? you know what I mean the way it, I can kind of take the back when you put somebody under so much yeah, pressure yeah. instead of all the technical details you know that's, I just like it you know yeah I wouldn't be the most technical person out there yeah. myself no, no I'm not I, technical I, no I, I, like some people some people can can tell you all the mills yeah. where your hands need to be by the millimetre I can't I can't take a mill hmm. You know, I'm, I'm a competent black belt, I would say. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've rolled at a high level and stuff like that, and on Polaris and stuff. Yes. But I wouldn't be like a, a Gary Townen. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Obviously, yeah. obviously, he's there's black le- belt. There's, there's level yeah, seven. Different seven. levels, you know, yeah, different yeah, levels. Yeah. But those guys are training strictly jujitsu 
six mm. hours a day. Mm. So it's only jiu jitsu, whereas mm. my time is broken up between MMA, yeah, no, it's, striking, yeah. you know, doing yeah. whatever. So I think there is a hundred percent this level. Yeah, and and as you say, like they train well when they were in Henzo's, they train me that early in the morning, two three hours, afternoon, two three hours, and then they Teach. used to go back to Gary's place. Seven o'clock, you might hours. be getting out of there. Seven o'clock, I've walked out of there. We've done a few nights with them. Seven o'clock, leaving at half eleven. Yeah, you know they're just and they just Are do that machines. every day. Absolute machines. You know, but I was surprised. I was I was listening to Rogan talking about them going. They train like animals and Danaher and I was actually really surprised because I seen I went to Henzo's a lot. Me, I was there for a week and me young kind of stayed so I wanted to just go down and see he was all right and then we flew home and he stayed there but I was surprised with how kind of light their spars were yeah like you no couldn't you, you, each you other. couldn't this is what people think like oh they did two hours three hours in the morning yeah. same again in the afternoon same like, how the fuck could you roll 100% in the morning for three hours yeah same again in the afternoon yeah. and same that night you could, just couldn't function the next yeah. day like like so I was talking to uh, Gordon when he was in uh, Troy Star and he was saying even even the Troy Star lads like Tom and stuff like that the morning session would be more technical based and they might do five rolls wouldn't be the hardest rolls like mm. in terms of uh, the percentage like going for everything 100% like if somebody passes a guard no problem try and walk, or it'd be that time where you're trying to walk on mm. a specific put thing. yourself in a bad position then that evening then there might be one technique instead of five I just did that morning don't do too much drilling and it's just Spar mm -hmm. uh, roll, he heavy rolling that night. You see, mm -hmm. a bit of time to recover the next morning, which I are up doing something, you know. Um, but it's not. You you just couldn't do that hundred percent all the time. Every class, it's insane. Mm -hmm. So give it's like say even on the bike, you can't go hundred k in the morning, hundred k in the evening. Do another hundred k every bleeding day. Like, you might do it for a couple of weeks, and then you be and like, then just oh, born out. Good luck. <laughs> see ya. You know what did he say? Undercooked cake tastes better than burnt cake. There you go. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Um, but uh, the, the the guys obviously know how how hard they train. Their structure is very good because they're winning everything at the minute. Mm. You know, I think uh, the move uh, Gardens move down to Puerto Rico. Mm. We took that whole camp down to so mm. Tim, Craig, Jones, Gary, mm. all them boys down to Puerto Rico. That's it's yeah. unbelievable setup they have down there. Yeah, no, it's um, it's it's kind of it's sad in a way that they moved out of New York. You know what I mean? That it's not so accessible now. But yeah, it's, it's paid paid I think I think, I think uh, yeah, for them, I, don't, I think um, I, I they, they, not that it wasn't wasn't suiting them. I think now it's a more privatized thing, so they can just focus on their own hard roles, mm -hmm. their own techniques, their own down uh, down there. Yeah. with a good group of lads yeah. um, that guy Ethan Christensen uh, he came out with Troy Star there's yes. another one or two Taz Garami I think yeah. his name is he, he came out with Troy Star yeah. that's, what, that's where that sort of affiliation came down because um, for us it's a hands of black belt so that's how they were all linked in together but they've got a good team down there you know Taz um, I was, I was saying him he's, he's slick. a tough slick yeah, deal he's very you know? slick he was yeah. only a poor belt when I, uh, was it a blue belt when I was there yeah. And he was just catching me with everything. But then yeah. uh, I think I was a poor belt over at the time, and I thought, you know, I just thought I, I, I would have like you know the the, the beatings of him, and it was just like that's levels even mm -hmm. in jiu-jitsu on the gi, yeah. and uh, they were just training six times a day in the in no gi, yeah. and uh, I was there for MMA. So and then throw them into MMA to be lumped around, course, and yeah, there's levels to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's 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 a different story, whichever way you look at it. Yeah, of course. Know. And so, I suppose we go back to the start. You were looking at UFC. Yeah. Went up to Andy's. Where was Andy at the time? Andy was a port belt in Jiu Jitsu. Um, and he had his own setup. They were actually the first day I went down, they were only after moving out of their old gym um, and setting up into a new gym in Kabarik. So it's where Dublin Toy Boxing is okay. now at the minute they were upstairs. Yeah. Um, and I went down the first day of their opening down there. So they were still moving. Andy actually wasn't teaching the class. It was a judo coach, Willie, Willie something, I can't think of his second name. And all we, I went down shorts and t-shirt, had no gear, no, no, no whatever. And she said, ah, just jump in, to be grand. And I think for for about nearly an hour, all they were doing was like grip fighting. Right. And I had a, I 
said this is the biggest load of bollocks I know I'm never coming back yeah. so for anyone that doesn't know grip for it and they, you know somebody grabs it you, you pull his hand yeah. off and that's it he did that for an hour and I says wait a minute wait a minute. there has to be so I was talking to one fella at the end of the class he says where's all the blading shorts t-shirts the MMA stuff and the, you know they take <laughs> down they do all that so that's tomorrow no, no, come down on Wednesday you'll, you'll get all that so I went back down on Wednesday then and it was, it was a wrestling no gi class and um, loads of good bodies up different bodies there was nobody that, at that class that was in the gi class so uh, went down and then I just found myself sort of down there more than I was doing any, any other stuff or wanting to do any other stuff out you know with the lads or if it was if, if the lads were doing something on a Wednesday or a Thursday and I'd say oh no we're going to train my meetings at the weekend yeah. then that became more and more and more and more and then I was just down in the gym every other bleeding every other waking moment hmm. And that's uh, one thing led to another and again I never never thought of uh, going the competitive route because I wouldn't have been able to kick snow off a rope up until I was 22 and um, yeah I ne I've never sort of been in fights out on the road where you know some fellas might need to chan chan channel their aggression yeah. and go down a boxing route or whatever yeah. because they're getting out in fights in the road yeah. that was never me Um so when people look back, oh, people I know from school, um, when they see me now, they're like, how the fuck did you manage to get into that? You were never yeah, a fighter yeah. or anything. That yeah. used to be always the class clown in school. Yeah. And it was, just, it was just something that I liked doing so much to the point where uh, I just I competed at it. And a few of my first competitions didn't go, didn't go too well. I think I got choked out 10 seconds of the first round in my first fight. Like, and I don't like things getting the better of me. So we just stuck with it, and here we are. And um, you were with, so you got signed, you Cage Warriors. Cage Warriors, yeah. Then you went to UFC. Yeah, so when uh, I got signed for Cage Warriors, I think it was about 2013, I had a bit of a hit and miss record, it was 3-3 three three at the time, so 3 wins, 3 losses. Yeah. Um, so my losses came sort of at the start of my career, you know, with, with a loss and a win, then two losses uh, and two wins. That's the way that the, the sequence yeah. would do. So I think when I went in the cage warriors, there wasn't really much expected of me. I think uh, if you go watch me first fight in cage warriors, I was fighting a guy from Russia, but he was trying out a cork at the time. The, re the judges, sorry, the commentators were saying, uh, you know, we were talking to Paul's coach and he was saying, you know, he's hitting this on the day, he might be good, on the day, he might be terrible. <laughs> Let's see what one we get out of him tonight. And they ended TK and all, TK and the man the second round. Right. And it was great, it was, it was actually on fire that night. Yeah. So they were saying, where's this kid coming out of? Yeah, yeah. And then I think how it got to that was, sorry, the fight I had before that I lost. And what happened was, I was fighting a guy from Cork on Andy's show. And I had got myself wound up. I was meant to fight some other guy, and they changed the fight two, two, like two weeks beforehand. And I was fighting a port belt, wasn't it? White belt, or right? Or blue belt. Everyone was saying, You're fighting, you fighting Tom McGuire? And I couldn't stop laying on him. So he's had to be fighting in cage where he's over in the UK. He's around about 10 years. He's going to smash the head in. <laughs> and I was going watching, there was one or two clips of him on YouTube, and I'd watched, and I said, Maybe what the fuck am I doing here? Yeah, yeah. And I went down and I was like a deer in the bleeding headlights and I was thinking about what he was going to do and yeah. I ended up getting taken down, got caught in a crucifix and by the time I was fucking, I even know, knew what was going on, the fight was over. Yeah. And I just said to myself, there's no way I'm doing eight weeks hard training and diet and cutting all the way down to 70 kilos to go out and get my head smashed in fucking a minute of the first round. Yeah. So then I, I, think I took up a different approach to uh, Cage Warriors and then I think I went seven and one in two years which is or eight fights in two years which is pretty good yeah. quite active and uh, but I'd only got beat once then the UFC came around and the UFC how much you didn't get a whole lot of notice for that first fight uh, look and you uh, fought a bleeding animal yeah Bechtich is, good, is quite good yeah, he's up yeah. there in the rankings and stuff yeah. I, I remember I was working out on Intel at the time and yeah. um, so I used to do a New Year's Eve shot with Cage Warriors for I think it was like two years for them and I was still I done one for some other guy for some other promotion the year before so I had done three I was getting ready to do a fourth and then Cage Warriors in the middle of December said I was happy through my camp like six weeks mm -hmm. of trying to do them couldn't wait and all and they said no we're not going to put the, the New Year's Eve show on this year so then I says right I said I'm, I'm at the doing half a camp so I'm going to enjoy my Christmas this year I have the usual bit of Field, go out with me nights out and stuff. 
the only, only half saving grace that it was anyway sort of half fit was Seardy was training to fight on the Sweden card anyways but I was still out having a few drinks and stuff but I was up training with Seardy helping Seardy every day for his camp so then I was 10 days after Christmas I think it was of, no it was, yeah about 10 days after Christmas I jumped on the scales and I think I was about 84 kilos and two days I said oh, yeah, I'm getting a bit bleeding heavy now for a light weight so I started watching my weight so I was 84 four kilos on the Tuesday and then on the Thursday morning that's when Andy rang me he said look if I can you make featherweight this is fucking 8 weeks 10 weeks yeah. of a push so he says look you came back to me then he says can you make any bleeding for Sweden I said that's in fucking 12 days <laughs> so you're talking 66 kilos to 82 I think 82 and a bit it's like 16 and a half close to 17 kilos I had to lose in 12 days so it's over 2 stone yeah. um, and I told him no I said oh you can't that can't be doing yeah, this that's yeah. impossible so then Siri got back on to me and he says just fucking make the weight you big fucking hell I said alright let's do it so we've done it Doing it the worst way imaginable, you know. Yeah. There's no easy way to cut two and a half, uh, two and a half stone in, 12, in days. twelve days. So I went down, got my head smashed in for three rounds, <laughs> and, and you know it is what it is. And then they gave me they gave me another fight, and the same again. I could walk around about eighty odd kilos, eighty one maybe, eighty two, probably a little bit heavier now. But uh, they wanted me a featherweight again. And, it's just a horrible cut. It's not nice to deal with. I don't. I can't take the shots down there at six to six kilos. I went in against uh, Rob Boyford, um, and he hits like a truck. Yeah. I, I was sort of looking back, and I think it was winning the fight. Um, and then I went in with sort of a slow, a, a sort of a lunging jab, and got caught with an overhand. And then that was it. Got released in the UFC. Yeah. So once it look, it is. Uh, people say you got this deal, raw deal. It's a, they gave you a deal. And I, I made the most of what was there. I don't try and fucking uh, make a sound like it was this or that. It is what it is. And looking back at that, I'm just asking you: Would you have done it? What would you have done differently? Would you have said no? Yeah. So at would, the, at the, so, at the so time, if you're coming up against you again, yeah, and you was walking around at 19 in your club, and yeah. the, said the UFC is out to get on to me. What would you say With to that, that 19 year old? Okay, so it's weird because. After after that sort of wake up, I know a couple of guys did did that type of wake up. The guy at Fountain Cage, where there's Damien Brown, us, um, he got signed to the UFC to cut similar weight, 30 yard pound or 16 kilos. Stevie Ray had to do it. Um, there's one or two more there, I can't think off the top of my head. They've done away with that big cut, so now if they're signing it in, they probably might ask you to go the weight above because you're not allowed to come in more than 10% heavy. So, so maybe that scenario wouldn't happen again yeah. if it did and I would say somebody in the club I would tell I, I would give me opinion whether yeah. or not they take it or not yeah, I would yeah. tell them no just yeah. keep doing what you're doing even if they don't come back to you now as long as you as long as you're winning in the organisations that you're winning it, it, it's it's undeniable so if you're out there winning on, on, on a regional scene or a, a, a European scene and you just keep winning and winning and winning hmm. It's inevitable that you're going to go to the big show. Mm. So even if you turn them down once, okay, but there's, we put it in the context. The UFC had went to Paddy the Baddy for Cage Warriors. He was the Cage Warriors champ at the time. And they, I think they went to him and he refused them. He, mm. he told them no. I think I think they wanted to sign him in at entry level money, 10 grand or 10 grand. There's 10 grand to fight, 10 grand to win. Yeah. And I think he told them no. Uh, he says no I'll just stick with Cage Warriors and he stuck with them and then he ended up having a couple of losses Yeah. so when you have a loss you're not going to get into the UFC on the back of a loss but then he had a good a good tear of it then mm. he had the winning there a couple of weeks ago mm. and now he's in the UFC mm. but I don't know what he's had to sign him for but he yeah. must have signed for more than what he, he was yeah. to say yeah mm. so it'll come back around if you're good enough the cream always rises to mm. the top it's inevitable they're going to get in so I would just tell fellas now with the experience I've had just hold off, just be, just persevere, you know. Mm. And then you went to Bellator. No, went Take. to, no, with a bit of a weird, a, a bit of a, a, a floating around, sort of a couple of years then with a while. Came out, okay, um, the UFC, taught me life was over, thought, oh, you know, I'll never get to fight yeah. again at a, at this, at a big sort of level. So, 
we were meant to fly for Obama in Obama. I forgot about Obama. Obama in say May, I think. So it would have been about. I got released. My fight, my last fight would have been June with UFC. Yeah. Then May the next year. So that's nearly a year out of cage. Um, came around with Obama, but then uh, that guy passed away over on fighting Charlie Ward over in the the stadium. Yes. Um, the Portuguese guy. Carvalho. Carvalho. Yeah. Yes. Um. MMA was putting a hold in Ireland and I didn't fight then until September I was nearly a year and a half out of the cage yeah. so I had fought, fought a tough guy Chris Stringer had been around the block for years in, um, in Irish MMA yes. not many people would know him now for the, the new entries to the scene but Chris is around and fought the hills hill and he's been around years upon yeah. years and terrible nice guy so I ended up beating Chris then I got signed to Bellator to fight Daniel Weitzel then I broke my arm yeah so they, I don't know what happened to that contract. So then Bama had said, look, we're going to let me, uh, have you fight Norman for the Bama war, war belt. So my arm healed, got, got in camp for Norman. Had a great great fight with Norman up north. north. Didn't win that. Um, came out there for Rob Sinclair, for Bama. Then for KSW came into town, fought for them. Then Bellator was stuck for a fight around a week's notice. I fought for KSW on the Saturday. I did like a CrossFit competition the following Saturday and then Bellator had rang Andy that weekend can Reds are fight next week you know he doesn't seem too scuffed up after KSW is yeah. he fit is he good to go Andy asked me I said fuck it let's do it yeah. so I fought KSW and Bellator back to back um, and then I did KSW then again over in Poland the bad loss over there I had a couple of wins there in between with KSW and Bellator and stuff with then had a bad loss, I mean, I was smashed over there and uh, Bellator, a soldier and all over there. Just, that's the life of a fighter. Came out of there, then signed to Bellator. Had two fights, uh, two fights with Bellator, one on one. Um, beat Charlie Leary. Uh, and then had a fight there with Georgie, Car 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 Canyon, I think his name is. Great guy. Yeah, Russian name. actually. Yeah, yeah Russian. Really, but he is yeah, Russian. Um, I had a loss to him. and um, Caught you in the guillotine. Yeah, him, he was such a right hand. Yeah, I think yeah. I'd won the four. I think I'd won the fourth round. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. And then I caught me with a cracker of a right hand behind the ear, wobbling me. I ran in for a sloppy takedown, yeah. and he was known for a good guillotine. Jumped on it and nearly yeah. pulled me bleeding head off. Yeah, yeah. So that's where we're at, and that brings us to this present day. Fucking, I don't <laughs> think there's anyone in the country at the moment, bar with that much fight experience and being around, like. I think, I think you I've know done. What I, mean? I think I've done. I've said it a couple of times. It's my only sort of claim to fame, is that I've done all the sort of all of those big ones: the UFC, Bellator, Cage Warriors, Bama, and uh, KSW. Yeah, I forgot about Bama. They were good nights. The Bama were good nights. Yeah, yeah. yeah down, good the, nights. down the tree arena anyway, where getting five plus thousand down yeah, there. Yeah. So that was a good night. Bama, I forgot all about them. They kind of kept everyone taking over for yeah. a couple of years, you know. Yeah. Mm. And um, I suppose we wrap it up at that. Yeah, that's that's where that's where we are now. That's where we are now. Covid's so. going to be over <laughs> soon. We see light at the end of the tunnel. Um, light at the end of the tunnel. Ah, yeah, that has to be. You know, this can, this thing can't come up. I believe never. It's just I know it's it's wrecking my head and it's wrecking everyone's head, but it, it just can't keep doing this forever. It's. It's a madness. I got really annoyed looking at all at everyone lashing the dubs out of it for uh, for training. Fit, healthy lads getting slaughtered. When we all know, I'm no hypocrite. Everyone's training, everyone's doing stuff, everyone's pointing the finger. But I always say, anyone I know, all them papers, don't buy the scum. All them papers, them red tops that expose them and that are looking for stories and then doing ropey but stories they, they, on people they're the first ones that'll be pushing them when they do the you know when they win like yeah, yeah. they do don't talk to them just come on your podcast push your own socials don't be dealing with them parasites because they're the ones that are after lashing the old I just, yeah, but like, that. like you were saying I just think it's wrong um, you can go you can go down to St. Anne's Park right now beautiful day yeah if you if you see anybody you know, you can walk over them, have a chat away. Yeah. What is the fucking difference? Yeah, what is the difference? And like I said, these are athletes, yeah. and they did it on their own. On their own. Yeah. Um, it's no different to what the the rugby is doing. They're mm -hmm. training away, but they're not professional, so mm -hmm. it's an amateur sport. So, but it's just the world has gone mad that you're, you're 
singling out lads for poking a ball around mm. and they're in training and it's an, it, it, it is an elite sport you see the way them oh, boys train savages. it's an elite sport they savages. just don't get paid for it leave them leave them be yeah. open up the country yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean yeah. if you want to my, my, my whole take on it is um, if you want to quarantine if you feel you, the need to quarantine in your own house away from out there and you don't feel safe and you want to wear if you want to wear five masks one on top of the other over your nose, if you want to put masks on your bleeding your ears, stay in your gap and do it. Yeah. Let everyone else do, uh, live their lives. Yeah. The only the only thing with that is, if you live, if you're out living your life, and you know that there's a high risk in your own house, that's on you. Yeah. That's where I, you know, that's where I'm at at the minute. Yeah. So I'm living my life is the the, 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 the way I normally do. Yeah. I'm on my side because I'm on my long runs. Am I outside my five k? Absolutely. Is everyone else in the country absolutely in Luke. So you can't, if you you know, half of them Karen's that are on um, butchering the Dublin uh, ah. GA team, they're going outside that 5k with their mates for a walk and a coffee. It's the exact same fucking thing. So shut your mouth, yeah. keep your opinions to yourself, and let the rest of us go on there. Yeah. That's yeah. the way that's maybe I'm a bit late. maybe I'm a bit uh, aggressive the no, way no, I thought no, about that that's where I'm at at the minute with all this crap. It's, it's like live and let live and you get all these bleeding virtual signalers getting it when someone gets emotional with you in a comment, not, most of all I don't reply, but that emotional they're frontline workers. It's like me going me put me me boiler's broken, I better not ring Paul because he's flat out. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like what are we paying these people for? To look at the sick people, yeah. we have the sixth. Wait till you hear this, right? We've the sixth most expensive healthcare system in the world. We have a population of five million people. I know. We have the sixth, and yeah, it's like okay. So who? Where is this money going? Like, do these? Do they not want to deal with sick people I that have flu-like symptoms but or then whatever? You, you look at somewhere else. Now we're gonna go down a rabbit hole now before we finish up. But you look at somewhere like the likes of Florida and Texas that's after opening up yeah. fully. Mm-hmm. No man, no nothing. Yeah, this is back. They're going back pre-COVID. Yeah, and and the the rates are falling, still falling. Yeah, it, it, I, I watched that thing um, you posted on your Instagram last night with that doctor. And I read, listened to the whole lot of it. Yeah, um. 20 minutes because obviously that's a man who knows what he's talking about he's a, a, a PhD yeah. in, in all this stuff he's a doctor yeah. and he's telling you get a bit more vitamin D live your life the way it is be eat healthy food get some sunlight and this thing is seasonal yeah. he says your man John uh, Fossey he said was out on some um, podcast or whatever and he says now we take 800 milligram of uh, vitamin D every, every winter you know, yeah. to keep your immune system. Says, why, why, why aren't you pushing that uh, narrative? Yeah. Well, because it costs a euro rather than 500 quid. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But look, I'm not a yeah. scientist, I'm not a doctor. I can only live the life the way I live it. Yeah. And I live in it, you know. And COVID is a bad old dose. I'm here. Come here and tell you, I'm now COVID the Yeah, no, I'm no, now, it's a bad old dose. There's, there's, something yeah, out, yeah. there's something out there that I've, I've seen people have. It's been in my own house as well. I've, I've had it. Yeah. I've had it. Mm. I, I think I've had it yeah. because my ma's partner Brian he got confirmed with it um, from work but it was around the time that they were down uh, they were up at 8,000 cases a day right. so they went t- testing close contact but I had a runny nose and I didn't feel I just felt a little bit shit for two or three days so I was quarantined I, well I locked myself sort of in the room for two weeks because I wouldn't be a prick and mm-hmm. pass it yeah, on yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's what I did and I'm, and I'm fine over it, you know. He, he's uh, 60 plus and he was fine with it as well. So, mm. you know, I do look, there is something out there. I know people have lost their lives in it and I'm sorry to hear any, anyone did. Yeah. But let's just people lose their lives to cancer every day. You can walk out and get a smack of a bus tomorrow. Yeah. You, to, you, you can't be locked in the house for and the rest of your life. On the other side of it, I've seen Ricky Gervais posted on his Instagram, uh, fuck COVID, he's getting a vaccine, right? And I looked at the comments underneath, slay them. Like, People slating them. If it's like, when did vaccine, we get to this? When, yeah. when did it get? Fair play to you, Ricky. Get Take here. If vaccine. you want my vaccine, lash that's that into as well. It's all good, That's man. what I'm saying. Like, whatever, when whatever, get suit, to this? whatever suits you, go and do it. Yeah. If you want to wear all the masks, you want to wear a hazmat suit going down the beach, what power to you? Yeah. Take 10 vaccines. Take mine. Take yours if you want. Yeah, yeah. Have it away. Yeah. But if we don't, 
them people are, are saying to you, oh, you didn't get the vaccine, you're a scumbag, you're, you're, well hang on a second, a vaccine is to stop you getting it. Mm. This vaccine doesn't stop you getting it. No. It only stops you getting terribly sick, but well, that's great. So you can still catch it, you can still pass it on. So if you have your vaccine, you shouldn't be worried about if we have my vaccine mm. or not. This notion of vaccine passports to go to the cinema or your pub, that's absurd. Yeah. When did we get like that? When did we get to this? You just need to boycott them places because I'm all for like vaccines or like polio vaccines or whatever got developed to fix people. But if you're going to start discriminating on people, when did it get to this? This is crazy, like, yeah. the way people are talking, going, oh, if you don't get a vaccine, you're a scumbag. I don't like this, like, I like suggestions. You suggest to me, do you know what, John? If you go over the 10K run, that'll make you better. How sound. If you come to me and go, John, you're better doing that bleeding 10K yeah. run. That's a different story. It's like, we all operate on suggestions. It's like, what is good for me might not necessarily be good yeah. for you. But when did we get to this stage of intervention that now this is what you're doing? I'm like, fuck that. Yeah. I'm not into that. Is this the way it's going? Like, you know? Uh, I think uh, they're saying, you know, July we're going to get out of this with uh, the amount of people vaccinations. Then September is looking like a bit of normality. But then what happens in September if there's a little perk up in cases? What are we going to lock the country back down for another year? Well, Who's well, paying for all this? But my, yeah. my, my family and friends all live in New York, right? They got their vaccine, vaccines months ago. Their school teachers off front yeah. line. I think in their their county, right, they were eighty five percent on uptake on the vaccine. Right. They are presently locked down again. The reason being because cases have gone off the charts. Eighty five percent of their county are vaccinated, yet they're locking it back down again. So if people think that we're getting out of this, just as I, no, like, I can't see, it. I, I can't don't see think so. I can't see September. I can't see this year. To be honest, you know, and oh, I just don't know where the fucking ends. Where, where, where does it end? Well, I think it ends with us. People just have to go, sound, I'm I'm opening me business. I am doing me thing. And everyone, like, there's only, how many guard is there in the country? And they have, half them are wide to it anyway. Like, we understand this coronavirus. They can't even protect the people that are in the nursing homes. It's like, yeah. let's put a ring of steel around them. And just let everyone do that thing. You but know you know what? what? I, I, I think uh, even talking to some younger mates uh, of mine, not that they're paranoid about COVID, but they, they seem to be following the restrictions down to the letter. They're not leaving the five can really boy. Yeah, yeah. Not that I'm trying to fucking go against any bleeding, but yeah. like I said, I'm just living my own life. But that, that, some won't leave that five k. Some won't do this. Some won't do that. And I'm just saying. If you live like that in fear all your life, you'll never, you'll never mm. live like you're not living life. Life's there to be lived and go out. You need to go out and have fun, enjoy things, you know. And a lockdown isn't fun for anybody, you know. And I, I've learned, like, it's I always look at any situation I come through, whatever it is. And with this past 14 months, so we've been the longest lockdown country. But looking at it, going, what have you learned from this? I've actually learned that 85 to 90 percent of the Irish population are terrified. Yeah, There's just some fear. Of what? That's the yeah. thing. That's terrified. Oh, down fucking now. Whereas all the people that own their own businesses, all the beauticians and hairdressers that have been messaging and talking to all this, they're all mad to open up. They're risk takers. They're the ones that went to banks and go, I want 50 grand because I'm putting it into this business and I'm going to make a go of it. You see, the thing is, what, what, when I'd be saying to people, when I, when I, obviously we don't own a business, but when I'm talking to any of them um, or whatever, I think they want to open up to the point where we were at that level three last year, mm. where they can open their business and implement the face masks, sanitising. You know, if that helps yeah. and, it, and it keeps everyone on board and they're two metre distance, but there has to be a way where people can walk or people can still earn their money and society being open without this need for this fucking harsh lockdown I know it seems like we're coming out a little bit now in the next coming weeks with X amount opening this opening you know um, but surely that you save your hairdresser instead of five people in your shop have one people mm -hmm. one person in your shop yeah. just say look there's your time you got to be in you got to be out if you're not on time your, your, your thing mm -hmm. is gone um, but they need to be able to earn money like you know that 350 is not good for nobody mm -hmm. when you're being that you're going to be taxed on last year's over the last four years. This year has to be get given back this year, so 
Mm. I don't know. I don't know what's coming off the back of this either. Recession, depression, all that type of stuff. Mm. You know, it'd be, uh, it'd be interesting to see. You. And I, I just like you have to operate on logic and common sense. If I'm sick and I'm in a place and I'm with an old person or I'm you going put in, in I'm going scenario. to put a mask on and yeah. you know I'm going into supermarket. People are so terrified that I'm going to put a mask on out of respect yeah. and look do me a bit. But like logic, I'm. Walking up out after being down at that beach yesterday, right? There was lifeguards all down that training there, right? Yeah. They're out in the water, right? They've masks on them. Like Fingal are training them and they're walking back up here out of the water with masks on. My uncle had to play tennis in PE last week. He goes, Da, you're not gonna believe your woman was making us wearing masks in PE, like playing tennis. Like all logic and and, and it's the people to have the degrees, the skill teachers, the, these people aren't stupid yeah. people that are doing this illogical, crazy stuff. It's like, like, where's common sense in any of this, like, you know? Uh, look, I said, I'm going to sound a blatant brap oh, while man. talking about this. Man, <laughs> I, I try not to talk. At least I didn't course, but I went down mad rap yeah. you know? It's just, common it's sense isn't very common. No, it's know? frustrating, and anybody, anybody in the talk that gets like that, the second you start opening up, yeah. they're like, why is this? Why, yeah. why, why is everybody uh, doing that? And why? Yeah. Just, you know, you're not, if you keep going at it, you'll just you'll never stop. And take your vaccines, wear 50 masks, I'm all for you, whatever you want to do. If you want me to step two metres away from you, I'll do that. But just a bit of live and let live. That's yeah. what we need. You know what I mean? Yeah. A bit of live and let live because it's people are hanging on by a thread, you know? Well, the way I was always taught was, you don't take stuff off strangers, and the government's are strangers to me, so we don't, yeah. we're not gonna take anything off them. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's just the way we am. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so, where can everyone follow you on? Give you our little Instagram um, and your Instagram. Twitter and... Oh, I fucking hate Instagram. <laughs> uh, Paul Reds or MMA for uh, Instagram, Reds or MMA for Twitter. I don't think I'm on that note. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. You're not on Snakebook, no? No. No, I don't know what the fuck that is. It's Facebook. Oh, Snakebook, Snakebook Facebook. <laughs> no, no, we deleted that about five years ago. Stuff. You'd see someone saying, ah, you know, having a barney with that fella and have about 800 comments on it. We don't need to PM see that. PM sent one. Yeah. <laughs> DM me. Some people. <laughs> so I deleted that a long time ago. You know, I was up Instagram there for a while because uh, I hate that as well. But it's a, it's one of them things that has to be on in today's society. So uh, I leave it on. So. Want to improve your mental health? Delete Facebook, delete Twitter. Go out for a run, <laughs> jump, in the sea. run jump in the sea, eat good food, <laughs> and take vitamin D, zinc, and uh, use common sense. And listen to house music. Listen to house music <laughs> all night long. House music all night long. That's what we need, yeah. Anyway, that's it. Um, please uh, give us a dig out on our YouTube. Subscribe. Um, send us. Uh, onto somebody who likes to listen. We have a good few listeners from Florida, Australia. Shout out to them. Um, and they send me videos of them attending Paddy's Day parades and all they be fuming. They send me photographs of restaurants jammed to the guild. Gills fuming. Yeah. DJs, bands playing. I don't want to hear it. People rubbing shoulders. So uh, keep sending me them because it'll be in turmoil looking at them. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Nice one. Now... I'm going to ask you, we're still live here at the moment. She just played me out. Toys over here, okay. What do, we sh do you know how to share that? X, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then it goes there. And video.